We have quite a few listeners this morning, so we want to thank you for joining us. If you've joined us for webinars in the past, we're glad to have you back. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Victoria Blute, and I'm the community manager of Lawlytics. My job is to keep you, the attorney, on the cutting edge of web technology, as well as educating attorneys about what works on the web to successfully market your practice and to reach more potential clients. Before we get started this morning, I've got just a couple housekeeping matters. Um, this webinar is being recorded right now, so there's no need for you to take notes unless you prefer to do so. As well, we're going to have a questions and answers session at the end of this webinar, um, but no need to wait to ask those questions until the very end. If you do have a question, you can uh, feel free to type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we're going to go ahead and answer those when the presentation is complete. In today's webinar, we have two panelists. We have Dan Jaffe and Larry Bodine. I'll quickly introduce Dan and then pass the mic to him. Dan is an attorney and also the CEO of Lawlytics. He received his JD in 1998 and was admitted to the bar in both Washington State and Arizona. He went on to build successful practices in both Seattle and Phoenix and took more than 100 jury trials to verdict before he turned his attention full-time to legal technology in 2011 when he co-founded Lawlytics. Dan, good morning. Good morning, Tori. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Larry Bodine, uh, who is a colleague and friend of uh, Great Perfect. Um, for those of you who don't know Larry, and I, I imagine that's very few of, of you here, uh, he's got quite an impressive uh, resume as both an attorney and as a uh, person involved in legal marketing. Uh, currently, he is the senior legal marketing strategist here at Lawlytics, and he also serves uh, as editor of the National Trial Lawyers and also as editor of Mass Tours Nexus. Uh, Larry has uh, developed what, what I think is a second to none expertise in uh, the, the evolving field of marketing uh, mass torts and specifically in multi-district litigation. And it's a real pleasure to have him here today. I'm going to be uh, turning the mic over to him for most of this uh, webinar as, as he's the expert. And uh, then I'll be coming back in for uh, some housekeeping stuff and, and um, questions and answers at the end. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Larry. Well, Dan, thanks very much for the uh, generous introduction, and I want to welcome everybody to the uh, program today. Uh, today's session is for attorneys who want to grow their law firms to include a mass torts practice. In the uh, time period that I've been studying and reporting on mass torts, I really think that this is the uh, future of uh, plaintiff's personal injury law in uh, in the U.S., um, and that's... Uh, just because there's a, a huge opportunity, uh, it's an excellent and rare opportunity for plaintiff attorneys to grow their practice um, and start a new practice area. Um, a lot of this uh, reason that we're holding this webinar is just the huge interest that's uh, gener been generated this year alone um, in, in some of the verdicts that have been returned in these mass tort cases. You might have read in the headlines recently that there was a $1 billion verdict against uh, Johnson & Johnson regarding their Pinnacle uh, hip replacement, uh, the De Depew uh, Pinnacle hip replacement. Uh, the verdict was returned uh, on December 1st, uh, and there's a uh, uh, multi-district litigation docket in Dallas where something like 8,600 cases are filed over this particular medical device. And then you might have also heard this year in St. Louis, there have been multiple uh, multi-million dollar verdicts returned involving um, Johnson & Johnson and the allegation that uh, talcum powder, you know, baby powder and shower to shower powder have caused ovarian cancer. The uh, verdicts have been $55 million. $70 million and $72 million. And uh, mass tort dockets have been formed in New Jersey federal and state court. Um, so this is, you know, uh, 
attracted a lot of interest of uh, attorneys who uh, see that this is an area that, uh, that has a lot of potential. Um, and with that, why don't we move on uh, to the next slide. The um, sort of uh, to go over, uh, uh, well, well, Dan, one, you founded uh, Lawlytics five years ago. Why don't, why don't you give us a background about why Lawlytics is really perfectly positioned to, to help attorneys who want to start these kinds of practices? Sure, Larry. I don't want to, to dwell uh, too much on Lawlytics, but I do see that there are some people in here who are either not uh, Lawlytics members or whose name I don't recognize, meaning that you're probably attending for the first time. And so, so just to go over it briefly, Lawlytics uh, is a um, software and a service that was basically born out of the needs that I felt in my own practice over the course of the decade and um, and the needs that I saw um, a lot of my colleagues have and continue to have uh, in their own marketing. And it's, it's really the struggle between uh, knowing what to do and being able to actually do it. Uh, so, so our system is, is basically built to help attorneys uh, predictably grow their businesses without wasting uh, money or wasting time. And uh, we, we see ourselves as being positioned right between uh, what we see as overpriced legal marketing companies that, that may charge too much or provide services that aren't necessarily in tune with attor what attorneys need at uh, the time that they need it. And so the way our service works is, is um, the, the right services are there at the right time without over committing. Uh, and then we see a lot of attorneys that are struggling with uh, lower end uh, software, do-it-yourself services, uh, free software like WordPress and so forth, and just really struggling with opportunity costs to um, be able to make it work. Uh, now how this ties into uh, marketing mass torts specifically, I know we, we have a lot of uh, personal injury lawyers who have uh, general websites uh, and, and who are, are just becoming more curious about how to break into this area. And, and as Larry just uh, mentioned, and, and I think as, as he'll go into in more depth uh, in a little bit, these cases are, are, are out there they're lucrative and uh, th there's really there's a lot of them that are uh, just not even realizing that they have causes of action and so there's a lot of ways to connect uh, with them in that regard but it requires education and that education is not something that's going to be uh, achieved strictly through either buying leads because those leads are already known and they're already out there um, or by doing uh, pay-per-click or, or anything like that so it requires education that education requires requires content and that's really where we're going to be focusing and that's that's what Lawlytics really excels at uh, doing and helping attorneys do for themselves and since this is really a wide open field uh, we truly believe that the attorneys that get there first with the best and the most content in, in these individual causes of action, uh, the ones that exist now and the ones that obviously will start cropping up in the future are going to be the ones that that have the biggest upside to this. Uh, the other thing that we'll be going back to um, time and time again, and that, that if you're a Lawlytics member um, or, or if you've uh, listened to other of our webinars, is that the internet is really a an equalizer. You don't have to have a huge budget to compete for any type of case, and that goes uh, for mass torts cases as well. And so, if you get anything out of this webinar, if you're already looking into uh, doing mass torts in, in in your practice, it's that the cost of entry uh, into really competing for these cases on both a local and a national level is probably not as high as you might believe. It, it to be based on other marketing sources that are out there. And we're going to kind of give you a, a, a basic overview of, of um, how that works without going into specifics of how to market for each um, individual type of mass tort. And then if there's interest, uh, which, which there certainly appears to be uh, later on, probably in, starting in January or so, we'll start going back and doing uh, seminars about how to market for individual uh, causes of action. And with that, Larry, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, Dan. That uh, really covers, uh, you know, all the points that I wanted to make. Uh, just to add that, you know, in my own personal situation, I moved uh, my blog and website to Lilix several years ago. Uh, it's, it was uh, one of the smartest things I did. I've had uh, terrific results, uh, and I sincerely believe, you know, we can bring those results to other attorneys. 
uh, coupled with the fact that you know we have met mass torts expertise we have uh, capabilities for attorneys who want to start a mass tort practice so if you're thinking about starting one you know uh, why go to a developer who has no attorneys when you can find a company that has uh, that was founded by attorneys that is staffed by lawyers who practice law and who are very experienced in, in marketing so with that let's uh, let's turn to the next slide about uh, what the current situation is with mass torts this is a really rare and unique opportunity for plaintiff attorneys in that there are many claimants who uh, you know there are many claimants who who have not found uh, you know an attorney and there are just not enough attorneys out there uh, explaining uh, mass torts to the general public and to, and to victims of these uh, uh, these mass cases uh, to illustrate it the federal mass tort docket uh, now includes a hundred and thirty five thousand cases and it's growing by hundreds of cases each week and the federal courts have set up 250 mass tort separate mass tort dockets to uh, consolidate these cases um, the biggest one uh, has uh, over 61 nearly 62,000 actions filed against the seven manufacturers of these pelvic repair systems uh, problem with them is they decompose and cause uh, painful nerve damage in the, in the people that have received it. Um, some other big mass torts you might have heard about involve uh, testosterone therapy, which has been found to cause heart attacks in the men that uh, take the therapy, and the drug Xarelto. Um, in fact, this is a drug that Arnold Palmer promoted in uh, TV commercials, and um, I wrote an article uh, explaining that he possibly died from Xarelto, which is a uh, a blood thinner that's designed uh, for people with heart conditions. Uh, however, it causes unstoppable gastrointestinal bleeding, which is what Arnold Palmer died from. And mass torts has become so, such a large area of practice, it now constitutes more than a third. It's 36% of the entire federal caseload. And on the next slide, we identify the main problem with this is that there are so many plaintiffs out there, but they don't know that they have a claim. Uh, according to the American Bar Association, only 10 to 20 percent of people who suffer an actionable harm actually enter the mass tort litigation process. And the problem, the reason this arises, is because there is a lack of information being put online by attorneys. Uh, one estimate says that uh, every year there are at least two to four million people who are injured uh, in a mass tort case. But here's the problem. There's an information gap. The party will know that they took a drug or had some sort of a medical device implanted in them. And point two, they know that they had an adverse event. Something went wrong. There was a, a side effect uh, escalating up to the, you know, point of extreme pain to possible death but the plaintiffs don't make the connection because some of these uh, side effects are, are are completely unexpected they're they're wholly uh, you know uh, you're taking a drug for one thing and then something completely unrelated happens and it will uh, often turn out in many of these cases that the manufacturer knew about that side effect um, uh, withheld it from uh, the, the FDA and, and, and federal agencies and um, you know, failed to put up any warnings about it. And so this is one of these few areas where there's actually you know, a crying need for attorneys to educate the public and, uh, and get active in mass torts. So let's talk about uh, opening and marketing a mass torts practice. What, uh, what I intend to do here is give kind of a high-level description of how mass torts cases work. So I'm not going to go into a detailed explanation of how to uh, prosecute a case, how to litigate it, uh, you know, which mass torts are better than others, but we will go into a detailed explanation of how to market one of these practices. So let's go into sort of the, the difference. Let's start with a, an ordinary personal injury practice. 
the uh, typical plaintiff PI case involves a, a single event, and that would be, for example, a car accident. And the a characteristic of these single event cases is that there is no economy of scale. If you file an additional case, uh, you, you've you've created all sorts of additional work for yourself. Uh, if you file an additional case, the discovery is going to be different. You know, the defendant can be a person, a corporation, a government agency. There's also no uniform complaint or uniform uh, discovery documents to follow. Typically, there are multiple issues and uh, multiple defendants because each case has different facts and different parties. So those are the primary characteristics of a plaintiff personal injury case, along with the fact that they're typically tried in, in state court. So a PI case is going to be tried in the states where you've been admitted, and you really have a limited opportunity to represent out-of-state clients. Um, the typical window of time uh, between filing an action and uh, reducing it to a settlement is anywhere from uh, two to four years. Now, in contrast, uh, a mass tort case is, is quite different. Uh, this is a case where you have many plaintiffs and the same defendant. So, for instance, uh, we were talking about uh, talcum powder uh, with Johnson & Johnson. You, you have one defendant which has uh, you know, the ability to pay a large settlement uh, such as Johnson & Johnson or, uh, you know, uh, Depew, uh, the hip replacement company, um, which is also owned by Johnson & Johnson. And the benefit here is that there is an economy of scale. An attorney can represent many plaintiffs injured by the same drug or medical device. Typically, they will have common issues or facts. And what the, what the courts will do is, uh, uh, once there's enough of these cases filed in the federal courts, uh, they'll entertain a motion to consolidate them in what is called uh, a multi-district litigation docket, or an MDL for short. And frequently, the uh, well, in all cases, the uh, court will create a plaintiff steering committee, and that will be composed of attorneys that have filed some of these actions. And they pretty much run the case. They they, they uh, handle the, the, the discovery, uh, they, they do the depositions, they, they keep the case on trial. And the beauty of it is, is in that many cases, the court itself will create a model complaint or a short form complaint. Uh, they'll also create a model plaintiff's fact sheet. It's kind of a, a checklist that you, uh, an attorney would go through to determine if uh, you know, a claimant, uh, if a particular patient uh, is actually a viable claimant. And um, all of these uh, activities, actions can be filed uh, electronically. So what, um, what this allows an attorney to do is to have a, a national practice to represent clients from all over the country, uh, but they're going to be heard before one particular judge. Uh, the uh, the federal courts will consolidate these, typically where uh, uh, everything turns on uh, a particular medical device or a particular drug that had a side effect, and it and it does this for um, you know for purposes of efficiency. So now um, MDLs that I'm going to focus on concern you know a, a medical device or a particular uh, drug with a side effect. Uh, but there are all sorts of other uh, mass tort cases that I'm not going to go into, such as plane crashes, hotel fires, securities fraud, and uh, antitrust. Um, so focusing just on the pharmaceutical and, and medical cases, you know, when you have one forum, you have forum complaints, you have a steering committee that's going to run the case, it's a golden opportunity and allows plaintiff attorneys to really focus on marketing and finding clients. Because once you've sorted through you know, what the device is and the kind of client you're looking for, you're essentially filing the same product liability action over and over and over again, filling in the blanks with the uh, forms that the court itself has provided. 
So with that, I know a question often arises or that I get asked a lot is, you know, what's the difference between a mass tort and, and a class action? Because uh, many attorneys are familiar with a class action, but uh, what's new is how mass torts uh, work. And frankly, what you have uh, with a class action is sort of a, an older method to resolve uh, mass harms. Uh, and it's been eclipsed by this uh, new approach of creating multi-district litigation dockets. So in a class action, all the plaintiff claims are tried together in one lawsuit. The disadvantage of this is there's no real way for attorneys to join the class action. You know, this is a case that's pursued by one attorney and it's their case. The other disadvantage about um, a class action is getting the class certified. Now, in federal court, you have to follow Rule 23, uh, sub B, sub 3. Uh, and that is uh, in, in which the court recognizes the class. And this point is typically the most heavily litigated point in the entire litigation. Uh, and it's become very difficult now to get a class certified. And that's because of recent US Supreme Court decisions and new federal laws. And uh, you know, if uh, you can't get the class certified, you don't have a class action. So the difference is with a mass tort, all the plaintiff claims are filed and tried separately. And attorneys can join a mass tort docket by filing their own cases. So it creates, a, it creates an opportunity for lawyers to network with each other nationwide and to pool their resources. So evidence used in one action can be used in another action. And there's no court approval that's required to, to file an action. And uh, you know the loss or success uh, in a single case, either in a settlement, or, well, there's really no loss in a settlement, but in, in a trial, uh, it doesn't affect the other cases. And uh, typically, it, inv uh, it involves a drug maker that has failed to warn of severe side effects or unexpected injuries. So what you have are plaintiffs with different injuries, but they're all caused by one product or by one drug. And again, all these separate cases are consolidated in one court. So let's move on now to um, why these mass tort cases are, are, are so attractive uh, to plaintiff uh, personal injury attorneys. Um, and it starts with the fact that it's really difficult for a plaintiff personal injury attorney to uh, or a law firm to distinguish itself, because you know the case, the the court may uh, the, uh, the the law firm may take cases that uh, turn on auto or, or motorcycle wrecks or nursing home abuse or uh, dram shop liability cases or uh, say uh, premises liability cases, and you you have to take all of these cases because really the the only common denominator is that someone had a severe and permanent injury. But to the potential client, uh, you, you've really uh, marketed yourself as a, a general litigator. You, know, do, you, you handle all of these various different situations. And it conveys that really you're, you're a, drag, a jack of all trades in this litigation, but you're, you're really a master of none. And I know from uh, talking to many plaintiff attorneys around the country with Dan, it's very hard to distinguish yourself. And plaintiff attorneys are reluctant to say, well, here's the one thing that uh, you know, I, I want to lead with in my marketing or emphasize in my marketing uh, because they're concerned that you know, it, may, uh, uh, it, it may cause them to be overlooked for all of the other things to do. So the advantage of having uh, a mass torts practice is that it makes it very easily easy for an attorney to specialize because it gives you an opportunity to focus on a specific injury caused by a specific drug or device. Um, so for instance, uh, one of the things we're, I'll be talking about a little bit later will be uh, the so-called IVC filters. And these are little blood clot filters, they're supposed to catch blood clots, and they're implanted in the inferior, inferior vena cava vein, which is a large vein that uh, leads to the lungs. And you know, there's a set number of manufacturers. Uh, uh, one of them, for example, is uh, Bard. Uh, 
in September there were 700 cases filed against them and one MDL. And now uh, the latest, latest that I checked, it's up to 1,000 cases. And uh, more than 100 cases are being filed each year. So it gives you an opportunity to develop a specialized expertise in the manufacturers of these. And uh, you know the FDA approval process that the company went through to get their product on the market. You can get into the uh, science of uh, how these things work, which, uh, you know, for me, uh, I find this uh, really fascinating. Uh, you can also focus on, you know, the different treatments uh, that are available. And then, of course, all this leads into, into, into your marketing, how someone who uh, has been injured or if a family member was uh, killed by this can recover damages through your services. Some other benefits of a, a mass tort practice is that uh, it's very inexpensive to find clients because of this economy of scale that I described earlier. And some of the recoveries are really striking. So for instance, um, you know, with the right case, if you mark it on the web, it can cost anywhere from a few hundred dollars to say up to $1,500 to acquire a new client. And this would be a client with a case that's going to settle for, say, $300,000. Uh, cases uh, involving these drugs, uh, Zofran and Xarelto and transvaginal mesh, settled uh, in the range of $100,000 to $500,000. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned before, there's really minimal additional effort or cost to, to file many of these cases. In, in fact, it's logical and it makes sense that you would try to represent as many clients and file as many actions in these kinds of cases. And uh, on the next slide, we go into a sampling of some of the older cases uh, that were settled uh, in the past. And as you can see, they're in the billions of dollars. Vioxx, for example, was an anti-inflammatory drug that was put on the market and it caused heart attacks and strokes. And as the litigation uh, progressed, there was a universal settlement for $4.8 billion. Another example is Yaz, which is uh, a birth control device. It had a side effect of creating blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes in women. And there was a, an overall settlement of $1.8 billion. And then again, here you see these defective uh, hip replacements, one by Stryker, one manufactured by Depew. And um, uh, going back in, uh, in the research, you know, there was an NBC investigation back in 2003 pointing out that, that these hips uh, fail, that they grind off little metal parts and, and uh, cause metallosis, basically poisoning the uh, person that uh, had it, uh, causing many patients to have a second operation where they went in and took out you know, the failing artificial hip and put in a new one. And if you just add up these four settlements, you see it totals up to uh, you know, $10.4 billion. So you can see that the defendants uh, have the ability to, to pay these kinds of settlements, which makes it uh, you know, an attractive area for plaintiffs, uh, personal injury lawyers to enter. So Dan, let's talk a little bit about uh, marketing uh, and marketing by education, which I know is um, you know, the preferred approach uh, uh, and the most successful approach that you found for personal injury attorneys. Sounds good, Larry. I, I think I got my mic back on. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, it, it really comes down to how many people are out there that have claims that don't know about it. Uh, how do they go about discovering it? Uh, and especially with the types of cases that you've been talking about here, um, it strikes me that there are probably a lot of people that just don't even know that these things are going on. Um, and, and so uh, if they're looking for things like symptoms that they might be having that might have been caused by 
something that's the subject of, uh, of one of these um, causes of action. Uh, if, if they're looking for what happened to a loved one, if they're, they're, um, they're typing in things into the search engines and, and, and searching otherwise uh, for answers to, you know, to questions that they might not even really know uh, that they have or how to formulate. Um, you, you know, I, I, I think we'll get into some specifics later on uh, when, when you talk about the three um, examples that you're going to talk about. But I mean, there, there's there's just a lot of ways that as attorneys we can connect with people uh, where they're at, uh, and, and I think that's where most legal marketing stops short. In other words, uh, somebody might not know that they. Uh, that they need an attorney, so they're not necessarily going to be searching for, um, you know, bear hugger attorney or IVC, you know, filter attorney right off the bat, which is what what most of the um, lead generation companies go after. And so, so what percentage of people are out there that uh, are just really? It's it, there. There's if you look at the total pool of everybody who has a cause of action, that's a total addressable market. Uh, and certainly it is a zero-sum game because you can't go above that particular number. However, unlike people that are, let's say, arrested for a DUI or get into a car accident um, or something like that where the cause of action is, is obvious, uh, what percentage are just out there that really don't even know that they need uh, your services? And so, um, Larry, do you do you want to uh, take it back over and go into some some specifics? Because I, yeah. I, I think the, the I think the examples are probably better illustrated than, than me talking in theory. Sure. Um, in, in fact, on uh, the next slide, let me show you sort of a basic uh, outline for uh, uh, a website uh, practice description for a uh, particular mass tort. The idea is that you want to put yourself in the position of somebody who, um, uh, you know, is doing research for themselves. You know, they know that they took a particular drug, or they know they know that they're having a particular symptom, and you know, and they're trying to trying to get to the bottom of it. You know, they're trying to find a, a solution for themselves. You know, and they're not going to research based on uh, advertising they see online or, uh, or TV commercials. They're going to go on the web, and they're going to look for a site that has uh, the following elements. It's going to have a description of the side effects. What are the injuries, specifically, that, uh, uh, that, are, that they're experiencing? Um, and then, um, you know, this is information that you can, you can essentially get by going on the websites of these multi-district litigation dockets. They'll have a plaintiff's fact sheet, and it will spell out what all the symptoms are. Uh, you can, uh, potential clients are also going to want to know about what are the warnings that were out there. You know, what did the FDA uh, say that this drug was approved to be used for? Uh, is, is there a possibility that, uh, and, and in many cases, there's a likelihood that the company uh, marketed, marketed it off-label for some use that was not approved and it caused uh, unexpected injuries as a result. Um, they're going to want to know about new medical research, and this is the kind of stuff that is coming out all of the time. And you can find out about this research by, uh, again, going to the websites of the courts and downloading either the, uh, the short form complaint or downloading some of the other complaints. And uh, typically, uh, in, in the cases that have already been filed, they'll recite all of the medical research. So you can find this, put this on your website, and educate your clients. And if you kind of see where I'm going, it's, it's like uh, you, you, your, your practice description should read like something you would find on a, on a university teaching hospital website or uh, something uh, that you might find on the, on the Mayo Clinic site because what you're basically trying to do is, is convey to the client that you're very familiar with their problem and you've, you've uh, furnished them with more research to, um, uh, to get to the bottom of uh, what, uh, what they're looking for, which is a medical option. 
you know, is, is there anything that can be done? Is there any way to reverse the adverse event or to, uh, you know, revise what took place? And, um, you know, if you have that on your website, uh, this is what, uh, the more you can make your website focus on the client, the more effective your marketing is going to be. So, in other words, um, you know, you really don't want to talk about your firm and how great you are or uh, list all of the verdicts that you've obtained because, you know, uh, uh, patients and potential clients, they're really not interested in all that. They want to know information about their injury and what they can do about it. So let, let's go through a couple and, of examples. Larry, let me just jump in real quick before we get into the examples and, and uh, just drill the, yeah, if you could, but thank you, Tori. Um, so, so when we're talking about, you know, not listing verdicts and so forth, we're, we're talking about having information about that particular mass tort uh, in isolation. And so, you know, certainly there's a lot of other factors in play if that information is going to be combined with your firm's uh, mothership website, so to speak, where you're maybe addressing other types of, of personal injury, medical malpractice, and so forth. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, social proof, case results, and so forth has a uh, place there. But in isolation, when, when you're educating your, your clients about it in the individual articles about uh, that particular mass tort, uh, that's where we think it needs to be really focused on uh, educating the potential client about what their situation is. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that, that, that part was clear. Um, go, go ahead and, and advance it again, Tori, please. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. That, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. So, um, so just to sort of get uh, uh, sort of close up, uh, uh, we, let's talk a little bit about uh, bear hugger. Uh, the bear hugger is a surgical blanket that is used to maintain uh, patient temperature uh, in the operating room. They're uh, made by uh, 3M, and uh, I think they're in use at more than 50,000 hospitals around the country. The problem with these surgical warming blankets is that they include a blower to circulate air. And this forced air system has been found to basically suck up bacteria from the operating room floor and deposit it on the surgical wound. And uh, this has uh, uh, caused deep tissue infections that last for months and months with, uh, with patients. And uh, the target client that you're looking for is someone who has had a hip replacement or a knee operation and had uh, some kind of deep, uh, you know, infection that was like all the way down, you know, on, uh, on, on whatever what is inserted, you know, the, the knee or the hip replacement that, that caused an infection. As of uh, September, there were about 700 cases, uh, I'm sorry, in October, 700 cases filed against uh, 3M. The courts in December 2015 created a multi-district litigation docket, and it's located in federal court in Minneapolis. And as I mentioned, uh, about 100 cases per month are getting filed. The last I checked in December, there are about 900 cases. So what I would do in this case is the uh, get a copy of the plaintiff fact sheet, which is online, uh, as well as a uh, medical form that sort of describes uh, all of the medical records that you're going to need, and then download a, a copy of the complaint, and then use the outline that I just offered to sort of go through uh, using those documents. What are the symptoms, the side effects, what are the injuries, what did the FDA have to say, what's the latest medical research, and what are the options for someone who had a bear hugger blanket used in surgery. And this is a perfect example of where someone, well, someone probably didn't know uh, because they were unconscious that this particular surgical blanket was used. It would only come out through an examination of the medical records. But the one thing that they do know is that they had a hip replacement and they had a deep tissue infection. And it's an opportunity for attorneys to educate you know, to connect the dots, to educate clients about the injury and what might have caused it. So uh, turning now to example two. 
just real Which quick, the, Larry, uh, if you don't mind me yeah. jumping in, uh, if you if you go back to, to example one for just a moment, Tori, uh, this is this is an example of of a um, cause of action that is uh, national, I I at least in scope, uh, but that when potential clients are searching for information about what happened, it always happens at the local level um, in a hospital. And so a as you're crafting your strategy for uh, reaching out to those uh, potential clients and, and, and educating them, um, a lot of, of the focus needs needs to be uh, or, or would would benefit you from being a local in nature as well as as um, as as uh, general and there's really an opportunity for if, if a firm wanted to come in and really do bear hugger for example on a uh, massive scale to be able to have a uh, bear hugger website for example that covers not only everything you would want to know about it, how to recognize whether you actually um, have suffered uh, an infection based on bear hugger, but also to really go in and talk about uh, not only individual uh, jurisdictions, but uh, individual hospitals and in, in individual jurisdictions. And I imagine that there's some firm out there that's going to, um, you know, really take advantage of of cases like this and create a site that has information about literally every hospital where this bear hugger uh, device happens to be in use. Because wherever it's at, uh, there are people looking for why they suffered an infection at that hospital. Good point, Dan. Thanks again. So uh, on to our example number two. So to just sort of refresh uh, that an IVC blood clot filter is uh, something that is uh, inserted in this large vein, the uh, IVC vein, and it's a little cage-like device with spindles that stick out and it hooks on the sides of the vein and it's kind of like a basket and it's designed to uh, catch blood clots. Uh, the problem is that uh, it, uh, it not only catches blood clots, but they tend to break apart and the spindles will break off and they actually cause blood clots. They, uh, these pieces of metal travel around the bloodstream and they stop and they perforate organs. And some of these were designed to be removable and uh, others were designed to be permanent. And there are actually seven different manufacturers. And at this point, it's sort of very uh, early in this litigation because it's uh, scattered in courts uh, all over the country. Uh, there, there is a, um, hang on, let me find my notes here really quickly. There uh, is a, uh, uh, a multi-district litigation docket uh, created in, uh, in the federal courts, and it's actually in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, uh, but they're also scattered in, in other locations because uh, uh, based on the different manufacturers. For example, uh, the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas has set up a multi, uh, sort of a multi-county, multi-location uh, litigation docket of its own, uh, and it's taking cases uh, from people all over the country who um, have evidence that they were injured by the Rex Medical IVC filter. Uh, the California courts have done the same thing with an IVC filter that was made by a company called uh, Cordis. Uh, there's also another MDL in the uh, U.S. District Court in Indiana with about a thousand cases for IVC filters manufactured by Cook. So you can see that there's really a lot going on here. And the typical plaintiff that you're looking for is someone who came into the emergency room because of some kind of trauma. You know, they were in a car accident, they were shot, they were a crime victim, something like that. And uh, emergency room doctors uh, implanted because in cases like that, you know, there's a danger that uh, blood clots may form. But there are also medical conditions uh, where blood clots can form. And uh, uh, so it, it's not necessarily someone um, that, that has a trauma, but they have some other, some other condition, usually a circulatory problem that uh, causes the need for one of these to be inserted. So um, 
again, you're looking for someone who um, uh, was, was a trauma patient, uh, someone who had what is known as deep vein thrombosis, which is, it could be like a blood clot in the leg, or someone who is, uh, had a pulmonary embolism, which is a, a blood clot in the lung. And one of the uh, uh, advantages of this, uh, so just focusing on one of them, uh, the US federal court in uh, Indiana, the court has created a short form complaint. And it creates an opportunity for you to just read it and base your website on the elements of the complaint where you identify or you inquire about, you know, did you have this type of filter? Did you have this kind of injury? Do you have medical records that show, you know, the following evidence? And what's most encouraging about this is uh, one of the companies, uh, Bard, uh, announced uh, to shareholders in one of its securities filings that uh, in September that it was now actively settling these cases. So, you know, the opportunity exists to, to file a claim and uh, essentially uh, participate uh, in, in one of these settlements because the company is, is, is actively trying to end this litigation. Dan, was there anything you wanted to add on that? Well, you mentioned uh, a number of different um, medical conditions that could cause people to end up having these filters uh, implanted, maybe even while they were um, you know, unaware of it. And uh, it, it strikes me as um, not a lot of people are going to be searching for IVC filters unless they become aware that they have a problem caused by it. But if they are reading about what happens after deep vein thrombosis, for example, uh, and you happen to have a whole section on your website about uh, recovery from deep vein thrombosis and how it may have been treated by these IVC filters and how you, then you need to be aware of it. Um, there, there's a great opportunity there to reach people that otherwise might not know that, that they could be affected too. Very good point, Dan. And then just sort of uh, move on uh, to, to my third example. Um, these are cases involving talcum powder. And the litigation is in a, a very early stage on this. What has brought this to the national attention, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, juries in St. Louis have returned verdicts against Johnson & Johnson for $50 million, $55 million, and $72 million. And there's at least 1,200 cases against Johnson & Johnson in Missouri, but also in the New Jersey and California state courts. Now, last October, the federal courts created a federal multi-district litigation docket, and it is based in uh, New Jersey. And the allegation is that uh, talcum powder causes ovarian cancer. Uh, and the way that this has been proven in these cases in St. Louis is that um, the, the women who had ovarian cancer and survived it had their organs removed. And uh, upon examination, they found talcum powder in their ovaries. And making the case even more compelling is that there, there's been scientific research going back as far back as 1971 uh, showing a connection between talcum powder and cancer. And so it, you know, it's a straightforward thing to state that Johnson & Johnson has been aware for 40 years about this connection. Um, coupled with the fact that they, they bought all of their talcum powder from a particular supplier, which, put, uh, which furnishes material safety data sheets with each uh, shipment of the talcum powder it would, or the raw talc that it would send to Johnson Johnson, and it put health warnings on it, uh, health warnings about the dangers of talc. But Johnson & Johnson has never put any kind of a warning on its baby power or shower to shower products. So in a case like this, Typically, you're looking for an older woman who perhaps has used talcum powder for 10, 20, or 40 years. And um, of course, you want to have an, an ample description of ovarian cancer on your website, You know, uh, discussions of what it is, um, uh, how it's caused, and, uh, some, you know, and just reciting one of these many studies, which you can get from a complaint filed uh, in the federal multi-district litigation on uh, the connection between talcum powder and ovarian cancer. 
Dan, what would you add on that point? Well, so we have a number of questions that have come in, uh, both through messaging and through the, the questions area, and we're holding most of them in, until the end, or we'll answer them privately. But there's one that was, was just asked that I think is really relevant to what you're talking about with talcum powder. And that is, uh, and, and I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, do I need to find cases uh, that are in my my state, so the state that I'm licensed to practice law in, in order to participate in these, or can I reach into other states uh, and um, and participate in cases that might have originated outside of, of um, the normal state jurisdiction where I'm licensed? Yes, you can reach out into other states, and I would highly recommend you do that. You're you're not restricted to representing uh, people in the state where you're licensed because this is diversity litigation. The, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the um, efficiencies that the federal courts are trying to find here is to, to find all, all the potential plaintiffs and all the potential claimants and, and get them heard at once. And, um, you know, the, the many attorneys have built, um, well, I should say, some law firms have built uh, large national practices representing clients from all over the country against a particular uh, defendant. Right, and, and I think that um, the talcum powder example is, is a really poignant um, example, especially contrasting to some of the others where the plaintiff understands that the cause of action, even if it was caused by something that's national in scope or a national um, company, happened in a local hospital, whereas talcum powder would be an example of something that could be purchased over, over obviously many years from many different locations in many different states and so forth. Uh, and, and so the, the marketing of that would not necessarily um, involve any local element uh, at all to be effective and, and could be something that if done uh, at a very high level could bring in cases from everywhere. And so, you know, somebody that has the definitive resource or, or one of the definitive resources on uh, talcum powder um, caused uh, cancers and, and so forth, uh, you know, could really have a um, a practice that's pulling people from from everywhere, and so your pool your pool of uh, potential clients uh, is is really the um, entire female population of of the country above a certain age. Do, do, you, do you have any any um, sense, Larry, of of how um, how many people might actually eventually have causes of action based on this? Well, the potential uh, plaintiff pool is uh, hundreds of millions of people. It's basically, as you pointed out, half the population of the country. Um, you know, this was, these are common household products that are just women have used for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And, uh, you know, the last thing you would expect is that it would cause ovarian cancer because there's, there's no warning about it. And there really hasn't been any uh, discussion of it until these uh, verdicts emerged. And until, um, you know, at least in the cases of St. Louis, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the evidence showed that uh, Johnson & Johnson was, was aware of these cases. They were aware of the studies. And, uh, you know, they, did, uh, they formed uh, lobbying groups and, and, and did everything to, to basically hide this particular side effect. And you don't need to file this in the, the district court where the, you know, the, the party lives. You can file it directly with the multi-district litigation court. And so the mechanics of, of doing that, uh, Larry, because I, I think that there may be some, based on some of the questions that we're getting, there's some people that, that this is, is very new but interesting to. Um, what kind of... of of effort in terms of, of research, drafting, pleadings, and so forth. Um, what kind of expenses in terms of, of engaging experts and really, you know, proving this out? Uh, would the average attorney who's not um, not on the committee for any individual case or not, you know, not directly involved is is just bringing cases in? What would they expect? You know, I didn't want to get into the uh, mechanics of how to litigate or prosecute one of these cases. Uh, what uh, what I would uh, in, encourage you to do is to uh, is, is 
is to pick two or three of the mass torts that uh, that you find interesting and to, to do your own deep dive. Um, you know, you can visit the uh, Mass Tort Nexus website uh, where I've been um, writing articles about mass torts for closing on uh, two years, uh, uh, as well as uh, there are conferences that focus on this, uh, and there are, uh, uh, you know, educational courses uh, on how to try and get into a mass torts practice. You know, I know that's that's basically the purpose of this organization, Mass Tort Nexus. You know, they have a four-day course where they walk through all of the mechanics and you know what what paperwork you need and what are the elements of a complaint. What we wanted to do here was just sort of to focus on the fact that what what makes these cases unique is that the um, that the uh, that the effort to find clients is uh, much more straightforward than an ordinary personal interest action, a uh, personal injury action, and that, you know, we, we've sort of spelled out a, a formula for these that once you've settled on a case and studied the science and the law, how you can go about uh, finding clients because, you know, to really boil things down, it's, it's essentially, as I mentioned, filing the same product liability action over and over and over again so that once you've uh, become familiar with the science and the law, you um, um, your efforts are really uh, focused on not so much, uh, yeah, because there's a plaintiff steering committee that is going to be looking for experts and is going to be conducting uh, depositions. And of course, you know, you would participate or, or at least just, you know, know about what their activities are. But uh, as an ordinary practicing attorney in one of these cases, your job is to find more clients. Right. But find more claimants. And, and Larry, that's that's great, and uh, I, I think I should have been more specific when I asked the question. What, I, what I'm really trying to get at is for the average attorney that's thinking about adding this is you know, maybe something that would be a source of expansion of their practice uh, and are, you know, really is wondering uh, how much commitment it takes uh, and on a scale of like no expense at all beyond acquiring the case to um, – to you know, funding all of the expenses in a complex medical malpractice case with multiple uh, expert witnesses uh, and so forth involved, um, just just in general, without going into specifics, um, how how expensive are these cases and how risky are they once an attorney gets them? Well, I don't really have a good fix on on, on the, what the numbers or, or the cost of a case would be because each one is different. You know, in, in some cases, there's 20 years of research, and you've got internal documents from the company that you can use against them, and, and, and others of these are completely brand new. Um, I can tell you that uh, the average lifespan of one of these mass tort cases is five to seven years. And, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, in order to fund one of these cases, you know, uh, it can take up to... Um, you know, uh, having a war chest of, of $100,000 or more to, uh, you know, to, to, pursue, uh, to pursue several of them. Uh, be, you know, but, but the point is you can have one case and have an expenditure like that, or you can have 20 or 30 cases, and, and the expenditure would be the same. Right. Uh, the, uh, and you had a part two to your question, which has eluded my grasp. Uh, you know, I, I think I think you covered it. I was just trying to to give everybody a general sense of of what kind of of commitment. And it, it sounds like the answer really just depends on the uh, type of case, how advanced it is, how much uh, legwork has already been done by other plaintiffs and other plaintiffs' attorneys uh, in these types of cases. Is 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 that the general gist yeah. of it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you should look at these cases as a long term proposition, something that you're you're going to you know invest a lot in now and, and there, you know, is going to be a return, you know, uh, five, six, seven years down the road. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how risky these are, uh, just to sort of give you one example, um, there's uh, multi-district litigation that started, uh, in fact, there's an MDL just created involving uh, Roundup which is a, a weed, the most widely used weed killer. 
uh, in the world. I mean, it's used on all the corn and all the soy and most of the vegetables that you're going to eat. And uh, the uh, action asserts that um, uh, gardeners, field workers, farm workers, landscapers who uh, use this all the time uh, got a rare form of uh, lymph node cancer called uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, this is new litigation. Um, you know, I don't know that there's actually an expert that, 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 can, that can testify about specific litigation, but there's a huge amount of interest in it. And uh, in this case, you have a defendant, Monsanto, who is, which is one of the largest companies in the world and is totally committed to uh, uh, defeating all these cases. Uh, you know, uh, the, it's, it's and you know the the MDL was just created in October. It's extremely early. I would calculate that one to be something that's uh, that's very high risk. Uh, in terms of finding one that's that's low risk, uh, you know I would recommend you you find an MDL that was created uh, three, four, five years ago, where the litigation is uh, more advanced. It's an easier matter of proving causation or as I mentioned in the IVC filter case where you have a company that's essentially announced to its shareholders that it's settling. So the thing is, there's the least amount of risk when it's known that the defendant is settling. However, it's going to be late in the litigation and it's going to be harder to find clients. Gotcha. Uh, and more expensive to find clients. So that's the trade-off here. Uh, if you're early in the litigation, it's very easy to find clients. Uh, however, uh, it's it's the highest risk. If it's something that's really mature, it's the least risk. But you know, um, there's going to be law firms that have spent four years looking for clients. That makes sense. That that makes sense. And so, is is there is there a place, um, and may, maybe it's Mass Taurus Nexus, to really to to dive in and get a sense of what, um, depending on on how well funded the firm is, how much risk they want to take on, uh, which um, which causes they might uh, best uh, to, you know make small bets on. Yes. Uh, well, I would encourage you know everybody to uh, to read the reports about you know what I'm finding. It's uh, updated every day on Mass Tort Nexus. There's a newsletter that you can subscribe to. Uh, it's also connected with courses you can take. And then there's a twice a year conference called uh, uh, Mass Torts Made Perfect. It's held in uh, Las Vegas, I think, in April and October. Um, it's sponsored by one of the, the major mass tort law firms, uh, Levin Papantonio, based in Florida. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You'll, you'll find out a lot of, about the mass torts that the firm is handling. Um, uh, and as you get more into this, you'll find that uh, you know law firms like Levin Papantonio are actively seeking to have attorneys find clients and then refer them to them. So you know, there's really a lot more at work behind the scenes here that that we haven't really touched on, and, and it would be something that you know would be well covered in a, a four-day conference. What I wanted to convey here was that uh, in in mass torts, there's a unique opportunity for plaintiff attorneys to get involved, just because this is, you know, thanks to the efficiencies of the court, it's it's been set up so that you, what you really focus on is is uh, finding new clients and. Uh, it's a growing area. It's an area where uh, clients need a lot of education, and there just aren't enough attorneys now providing that education to them. Were there other questions, Dan? Uh, you know, the, I was. It's, that pause was actually me looking through to see if, if there are other questions that make sense in the context of, of, of what we're talking about uh, right now. Uh, and and I, I, don't, I don't see any that have come in that we haven't addressed uh, that, that are good uh, for now. But we'll, we'll get back and, and we'll take another look and see if there's any in a couple minutes when, when we're done. Um, with this slide, I just wanted to just reiterate that obviously uh, there are 
uh, cases out there that are very lucrative. There's an untapped market and uh, that there is this opportunity when you educate uh, potential clients uh, to, to not only uh, get those clients that other people are competing for but also to create um, clients that didn't necessarily know that they even had a cause of action and therefore aren't interacting with the uh, more blatant forms of marketing that are out there. Um, it, it does require content and uh, the the firms that get there uh, fastest with the most uh, high quality content are going to be the ones that, that end up succeeding. Uh, Tori, if you could go on to the, the next slide here. This is a slide that we've used in uh, several other webinars over the past year. And, and for those of you who are just um, coming on to, to Lawlytics and becoming aware of us for the first time, we have a wealth of, of on-demand webinars at lawlytics.com slash webinars uh, that go over in detail how to do the these types of, uh, of things uh, and, and we'll be doing a lot more webinars coming up this coming year but this particular slide really illustrates uh, a content or the, the problem that all lawyers have when it comes to their marketing and, and it is a content problem uh, content is really what drives business online more than anything else uh, it is uh, it's the way to engage people that aren't otherwise engaged people that are um, using their their DVR and forwarding through television commercials those that don't see ads because they use ad blockers those that are uh, ad blind and even though they see them um, technically they don't click on them and so forth uh, this is the way that you reach people that are actually uh, looking for solutions in the way that you you um, you create a need for uh, people that, that don't even know that they have the problem yet and so that the only question is uh, if if you want to succeed uh, online in a, a large and cost-effective way you need content and so how is it going to um, how is it going to get there so one you need a website to be able to do it and that's one of the things that Lawlytics excels at in fact our, our system is is set up to allow easy publication in a, a very effective way and uh, the the majority of our customers uh, use our software platform to publish their own content uh, and, and if you're doing that then then great you're you're getting what you need as long as you're doing it consistently. If you're not doing that, then the question is, um, are, if you're not willing to write it yourself, are you willing to, to delegate it? And if you are, then, then that's great too. You're going to get what you need as long as you select the right provider uh, for that. Uh, we started out as a platform only where attorneys would write their own content and would um, bring in other people to write their content. And what we saw was just really a vacuum of of high quality content. Uh, it just it wasn't consistently created when they try to outsource it. And so over the years, we've evolved a very um, a very robust content creation department where we provide that service for um, a, a lot of our customers uh, as well. And so if, if you're a Lawlytics customer and you're thinking, well, how do I get started with um, with creating um, marketing material uh, for a mass tort that I think I might want to go after. Uh, if you don't know where to start, um, it's something that we may be able to help you with. We may be able to give you guidance if you're going to write it yourself. And it's something that if you uh, just want to have it done for you, we certainly are, are able to uh, provide it for you. And if you do nothing, uh, you're still really left with that void. You, you know, you need the content. And there's somebody else out there that is working on the content that is going to um, – to, to attract these clients and make people aware of, of that need. And so there's, there's um, certainly there's saturation marketing going on in other areas, um, TV, radio, um, other, other types of lead generation. But content, is, is, especially with these types of cases, is, is one thing where it's really an open frontier. Um, with that, Larry, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we get to um, questions and answers? 
No, I think we've uh, covered it. You know, once again, what we wanted to focus on here was how to market one of these cases, and uh, you know how it's a, it's an opportunity that has really sprung up in uh, recent years, uh, and uh, you know I would encourage any plaintiff personal injury attorney who is thinking about expanding their practice to to investigate this. Do your own deep dive, and when you're when you're ready to market it, find a company that has was founded by lawyers for lawyers that uh, uh, has some expertise in mass tort nexus, and and, and that would be uh, Lawlytics. Thank you, Larry. Tori, can you go ahead and advance two slides? I, I kind of got ahead of myself and said what I was going to say in that, that second to last one. Um, and actually, let's see. Um, actually, go ahead and, and go one further because I didn't see any other questions that came in that we didn't already address in passing. Normally, we just save everything uh, until the end, but some of these questions that came in were so relevant in terms of, of um, what Larry was talking about that I just I just kind of work them in. Uh, if you have questions about uh, developing a mass tort practice or, or about any other uh, aspects of your firm's marketing, we're always happy to help. Uh, if you're already a Lawlytics member, you know that. You know all of our educational resources that are available. Uh, and you know to contact us whenever you have strategy or, or, or technical uh, questions or challenges challenges that you want to, to work through. Uh, if you're not yet a Lawlytics member and um, are interested in finding out more, we're always happy to help uh, with that as well. Uh, as some of you asked during this webinar, uh, this has been recorded. Uh, we are going to be sending out a recording of the webinar along with the slides in the next couple days once uh, once it's prepared. And you'll get an email uh, wh whether you attended or whether you just registered, uh, letting you know where that's at. Uh, with that, Tori and Larry, I want to thank you for uh, this great webinar, a lot of great information. And um, we'll probably be announcing uh, fairly soon some follow-up mass tort webinars. And so, so check back uh, on our blog and our website often as we get ready to announce these. Uh, what we'll likely do is take... Um, people's temperature in terms of, of which uh, causes of action they're most interested in really drilling down on in terms of, of how to uh, market them. And, and we'll either focus uh, on one cause of action per webinar specifically or cover a couple that may be similar. And so look for those coming down the line uh, in the near future. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and, uh, and end the webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.